sir, you seem to have quite a delegation here, and they're all decked out in jackets, hats, and so on. Could you tell us something about that? Well, of course, uh, I claim no credit for many of these ideas. They've been dreamed up by people who are working for me, and uh, but the jackets, uh, they probably don't show up on television, but they're yellow with a blue shawl collar, and they're very distinctive. Now, we want these for several reasons. We can spot our own people wherever they may be among the crowd here at the convention. We can lay our hands on them when there are jobs that need to be uh, done as the convention progresses. I like the straw hats, too. I didn't know they were, that we had those until I saw them last night. A political convention in midtown is something new for Ontario Capital. Usually such meetings are held in downtown Toronto, usually at the Royal York Hotel. But the prolonged strike at the Commonwealth's largest hotel has changed the scene. Premier Frost has refused to cross that picket line. Even as things stand here, this arena's capacity, seating capacity of 5,500, will be taxed to the limit. Some 1,700 delegates began arriving yesterday. Add to that another 1,700 delegates, their wives and well-wishers. And it can well be imagined that a sardine will have trouble squeezing into this building as the convention reaches its climax Wednesday afternoon. But this morning, there's just a spattering of the delegates here as the sessions got underway. Indications are that this will be the largest political leadership convention ever staged in Canada. For the man chosen will become not just the provincial conservative leader, he will be the next premier of Ontario. So the decision is a public as well as a party one. The speculation that Premier Frost may announce the date of his retirement from office when the convention pays him tribute tonight. The candidates themselves will make a final bid for votes when they try to present their campaign programs to the floor of the convention tomorrow night. In the meantime, supporters of the Southern will whoop it up with buttons and balloons, pictures and placards, in an effort to drum up more support for their favorites. Varsity Arena will be quiet this afternoon, the first convention day, but the rafters are expected to ring in an ever-increasing tempo as the convention rolls towards its climax with the election of a successor to Premier Frost on Wednesday afternoon. Who do you feel is all in this uh, leadership? John P. Robart. And you? I'm on the fence. <laughs> I'm on the fence, too. <laughs> Who do you feel is going to win, sir? Kelso, Kelso Roberts. <laughs> Kelso, Kelso Roberts. Kelso Roberts. Matt Diamond. Dr. Diamond. And how about you, sir? Who do you think Well, I have no doubts that the London man's going to win. He's showing up very well down here, and I... See nothing but enthusiasm for him for, from all parts of the province. <laughs> Mr. Robards, how do you feel about your chances of winning this uh, leadership convention race? I think they're looking better every minute, and I'm delighted. Just delighted. We've got a wonderful gang of men here from London, among others, but we've got a real London gang here, and uh, we're putting the pressure on. Need I say who you're rooting for? No, sir, I think we have a man here who's going to take this convention. Who your favorite is in this uh, campaign? Can't you tell? Oh, my man. Can you see? Oh, Council Rock. Mr. Allen, who do you feel is going to win this uh, leadership party? Well, you can trust these delegates to pick the best man. I can. You can always trust the people. And we're all going to get behind him, whoever he is. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Foster, have you any opinion on who's going to win? The best man. Same with Mr. Allen. 
and we're all behind him, whoever he may be. Are you going to put a name to that best man? Right now, I hope it's our London man, Kelso, uh, John Robart. And how about you, sir? Well, uh, my button would indicate I'm for my namesake, James Allen. Mr. Allen, how do you feel about your chances in this race? I'm very optimistic. I've had a great deal of encouragement, and I feel now I have a great deal of confidence at the present time in the fact that I'm going to win this leadership con convention. And Mr. Cass, uh, who do you feel is Mr. Allen's greatest opposition? There's a great groundswell for Jim Allen now among the delegates and all through Ontario. He's the man that people are looking for to win the election when it comes in a year or two. And Mr. Yurenko, how do you feel about it? Very optimistic. The most interesting thing about this convention is, as Mr. Cass said, the tremendous pickup in the support for Jim Allen this past week. I think we're on the eve of the climax of his campaign, which will be reached tomorrow night. The groundswell is terrific. Mr. Bernard, is there any significance in the fact that uh, there's no mention of liquor legislation in the policy committee's report this morning? I would not care to make a statement on the significance of the party policy report. However, I do know Wally Downer's feelings on the liquor situation, and uh, I might just say that uh, when he is elected premier of this province, that he intends to make some changes in the Liquor Act. He, of course, or any change that he will make will be within the scope of what each local community wants. What are your own feelings in this respect, Mr. Bernhard? Oh, I feel very strongly about that, Frank. I, I feel that the party has erred in not making some announcement in their policy. It's time for a policy change. They should have done it. I'm with me, Tom Fox. And Tom, where are you from? I'm from the University of Western Ontario as a delegate representing the club there. And could you tell us uh, just which man you're supporting? Uh, I think it's probably quite obvious that uh, I'm supporting Matthew Diamond from the headgear and the badge, etc. I suppose this seems a little strange coming from London in the heart of Robartsville, but uh, uh, we think that Matt Diamond is the man for the job, a man with experience in two departments, transport and health. First um, initiated the point system in Ontario, worked on the Ontario hospitalization scheme. He's a dynamic speaker. The little burr in his voice should go over big with the farmers of the province. We think we've got a winner here if we can only put him in. I see you have a friend with you here. Graham Scott, you're from Western, too, aren't you? Yes, I'm first vice president of the club there. And you're carrying a banner <laughs> of a different sort. Then. Well, uh, well, I am backing uh, Diamond on the first ballot. Should anything go wrong and Diamond appears to drop out of the picture, I'm a solid backer of Macaulay. So we'll swing our probably our second ballot vote to Macaulay. If Mr. Diamond drops out. Right. <laughs> Derek Burney, the voting delegate from Queen's University, this morning moved an amendment to the Education Committee report. Uh, Derek, could you explain that, that amendment to us, please? Yes, uh, this morning a group of the university delegates got together and uh, felt that a, uh, an amendment was necessary to the educational report. We uh, commended the uh, Ontario government and the party for the steps that it's taken in the past and the steps that it's taking right now with regards to university facilities and university loans and bursaries and scholarships to students. We did feel, however, that further steps could be taken in this regard. We had actually two main proposals. One was that the facilities that are present be expanded. That is, that we would like to see more universities. We pointed out that we've had two new universities in the past two years. We feel that especially the northern part of, the, of Ontario is greatly in need of more universities. The second proposal that we had was based on the uh, problem of university students to get money. Now, this is a common problem of all university students. But at the present time, you see the grade 13 students that acquire 80% on their final exams receive their first year's tuition at university free from the government. Now, what we would like to see is that if these students maintain this average throughout their university years, the same allotment would be given to them by the Ontario government. We would also like to see 
Uh, as you know, uh, students that receive 80% are very few and far between in, in uh, high school and in university. Therefore, we would like to see this broadened to include more students. In other words, we would like to see the, uh, not the same amounts perhaps given to students. If you, if you achieve 80%, you get more than a, than a fellow that achieves 75%. This is only natural. This is what we believe. We don't believe in free university education for everybody. If you uh, are good enough to get a good university education, we feel that you should be helped by the, by the government. This is, this is the essence of the second proposal. Uh, finally, we added that we would like to see uh, continuing uh, consideration given to students that are attending universities a long way from their home. And th there are quite a few of them. I'm one of them myself. And where are you from, Derek? I'm from Fort William. Did the amendment pass, Derek? Oh, it passed. There wasn't one, one word of dissension whatsoever. It, uh, it passed without a, without a word. And may I ask? Mrs. Robarts, were you able to uh, go with your husband on all his trips to the writing? Well, not all. As many as I could. There are two children at home who take a bit of looking after. Did you find that on the trips that you did make to these various writings that the women are taking a bigger interest? Oh, yes. Yes, the women are very interested in doing a great deal actively. And uh, how do you feel about your husband's prospects of winning this? Well, I think he's going to win, of course. And about the convention here itself, Mrs. Robarts, do you feel that the women are taking a real interest here? Oh, yes, I, I do. I, uh, from the numbers I see, uh, I would say there are almost as many women as men delegates. Dr. Whitten, uh, you've been to uh, quite a number of conventions. Uh, could you tell us what the role of the women is in this convention? Well, I don't think the women's uh, role, if the Conservative Party is going to waken up, should be any different from the men's role. This is the trouble. I guess I have been this year at, uh, in a position that no other person in Canada has had since January as mayor of the capital. I've been on the platform and addressed the a big uh, liberal rally, the conservative rally, uh, the founding uh, rally of the social credit, and the founding rally of the uh, uh, new Democratic Party. Mr. Bell, we've heard a lot about smoke-filled rooms. Uh, what is the situation here at this convention? Well, I've been unable to detect any at this convention. We uh, stated at the uh, start of the contest that there was going to be no uh, pressure exercise from the association and that all the candidates would be given a fair shake, and I think they have been. And as far as I know, it's a free and a very open contest. Here in Toronto, the leadership convention of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party is nearing its climax. And even now, none of the candidates are predicting a clear-cut victory. Observers seem quite certain that three ballots will be needed before a winner is declared. Speculators got no help from Premier Frost in his swan song speech as he referred to the seven candidates as being all his boys. However, when pictures were taken following the ceremonies honoring Mr. Frost, the two youngest candidates, Mr. McCauley and Mr. Robarts, were at his immediate left and right. The observers had been looking for some outward sign from Mr. Frost, which might indicate his favorite. This picture could be that indicator. Then again, it might be just that the two youngest candidates were the first to reach the premier for the shutter snapping. Four candidates' names have popped to the fore since the start of the convention. Allen, McCauley, Robarts, and Roberts. At one point, it was Robert McCauley, John Robarts, and Council Roberts. Then at another point, the Attorney General's name was dropped in favor of that of veteran Jim Allen. But the names of McCauley and Robarts have been holding steady. The Allen camp has declared that they will swing their support to Mr. Robarts if Mr. Allen falls by the wayside on the first ballot. The swing to Robarts after the first ballot seems quite certain from the camps of a few other of the candidates, providing, of course, that Mr. Robarts survives that initial ballot. Mr. Robarts, how many uh, ballots do you expect this afternoon? Oh, I would never begin to even speculate. I hope 
good many. Well, uh, do you, how do you expect to withstand that first ballot? Oh, I think that I'll withstand it all right, and I'll be on the second one. Uh, have you felt that uh, since the convention started that uh, you have won a little more support than before? Oh, quite definitely. We planned our campaign that way. Now, there's, uh, there's been talk that Mr. Allen, if he doesn't survive that uh, first ballot, that he'll swing his support to you. Have you heard anything about that? No, I haven't heard anything about that at all, although it's a very interesting rumor. And have you anything to say uh, for London and Western Ontario? Well, I'm very pleased, of course, that I am to able to uh, bring this honor to London and to Western Ontario. And uh, I would like to express my thanks to the many people from Western Ontario that supported me because uh, I did have some good Western Ontario support. I believe I'm the first leader of the party uh, from London since... Oh, about the turn of the century, back in the days of Mr. Meredith. And I'm very happy to have been able to do this. Thank you. It's been a very trying day, and I do not intend to speak uh, for any length of time for this wonderful, wonderful convention complete. I realize the great sacrifice it has been for a great many of the delegates who are here from far parts of the province, and I uh, thank you uh, for your devotion to our party in attendance. I would like to express my thanks uh, to, and the thanks of all of you, of course, uh, to Elmer Bell, the president of our association. <laughs> and uh, to Mr. Hogan. And I will pledge myself to continue, to attempt to continue to give Ontario the finest administration it has ever had. With the heritage that has been left to us by Mr. Frost, we have a real basis upon which to work. There is a great deal more to be done, and with his inspiration and the example that he has set for me in the years in which I have been in the legislature, the years that lie ahead will be a challenge to all of us. It'll be a challenge to our skill, it'll be a challenge to our ingenuity, and it will be a great challenge to our ability to provide the economic atmosphere uh, to encourage the industry, which is so much a part of our economy and which will be so important if we are to continue uh, in the vanguard of Canada. We will need courage to meet the tremendous financial demand uh, that will be made upon us as we persist in uh, the various programs uh, of which you are all aware uh, for the betterment of our people. We will attempt, and I will attempt, to make every one of you proud that you are a resident of Ontario and proud that you are a member of the Progressive Conservative Party. We must, as I said last night, ensure that our party retains its predominant place in the life of our province. And of course, to do that, we must win. 
And uh, I suggest that all of you, when you go back to your writings, uh, keep this spark alive and never forget uh, that we will have to face uh, the people of this province uh, within uh, uh, some time in the future. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Prime Minister, sir, that is a trick I learned from you. <laughs> I can only say to the party, to the election battles that lie ahead, and together, you and I will give Ontario good government, we will make our people happy, and we will stay in power. <laughs>